Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before we get started, why don't you just introduce yourself? Absolutely. It's great to be here today, Kevin. So I'm Julia White. I am the Corporate Vice President of Azure Product Marketing. I've been at, gosh, Microsoft 20 years now, um, but the past uh, five years have been focused on the Azure business specifically. Well, that's great. So thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, you know, as you know, we've been putting together this, this series of interviews with people. And we started with the CIO of Schneider, Elizabeth Hackinson, really focusing on kind of what's the impact been of the global pandemic on customers' digital journey, let's say, and what's been the impact of it. And uh, so I'd like to start this with a question, just basically, you know, at what point did you know that this pandemic was really going to be having an impact? And maybe just both per personally and professionally, at what point did you go, wow, this is really something special? Yeah, you know, Microsoft was one of the earliest companies to send employees home and move us 100% to remote work. And so it was actually very, very early in a pandemic. I mean, we'd obviously have employees in China who'd been going through it and then, and then in Italy very quickly after that. And so the minute, it was over, almost overnight, they set us, sent us home and said, we don't expect to see you until October. Um, and it was almost hard to believe at first. Um, but then you like, so I started working from home. And then it was in the weeks after that, both of my kids' school was also uh, changed. And they, they very quickly said the rest of the school year will be at home. And again, and it was such a, it went so quickly and it was for such a long period of time. It was hard to grok, but that you realize very quickly, like, oh, this isn't like a short term thing. We're going to be doing this for a while. The speed with which it hit our company yeah. was really quite incredible. And as we talked to our CIO, one thing she emphasized is kind of the, the you know, how important partners were as uh, she was accelerating some of the things that we had planned. And, and, and these are my words, not hers, but, you know, we had plans that say may have we planned two to three years that we had to execute in two to three weeks. Right. Uh, and certainly Microsoft has been, well, one, not only was an incredibly important partner through this, uh, uh, through the pandemic, but has been a big part of Schneider's digital journey in general. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that, for instance, happened with us is, you know, we were running Skype and it was on premise and we had to uh, accelerate very quickly to Teams because we simply couldn't scale the on-premise solution uh, fast enough. And again, Microsoft was very helpful in making us do that. I'm just curious, you know, do you have any other stories of other companies like us that went through similar experiences where there's this acceleration of plans perhaps? I guess I can't think of a customer we worked with who didn't. And there's a great quote that uh, that Satya said in our earnings was, we, you know, we've seen two years of digital transformation in our customers happen in two months. And, you know, so your story I saw all over the globe. I mean, I'll pick a couple interesting examples. The first one is the U.S. Uh, Center for Disease Control, the CDC. And obviously they had a massive uh, amount of work to do right away and not necessarily the most modern systems. And so just one thing they worked with us on is using our healthcare bot and be able to create a basically a way for people to triage and understand if their symptoms were at risk, should they be tested, should they not be tested? And remember early on, there weren't as many tests available as we wanted. And so giving people real-time information and triaging that was essential really, really quickly. And so um, actually since March, they've created, um, with using our bot service, uh, 1,200 different COVID-19 self-assessment bots. And it's actually touched 18 million individuals in just in the past few months. So just that kind of scale is what you can get when you're using cloud technology as an example. But, you know, it, thinking about, I think a very common one, right? Uh, moving to remote work like yourself. I worked with a national Australian bank and they moved again almost overnight, kind of from two, two days over the weekend, essentially went from all on premises into using a combination of both teams and then moving to VDI with our Windows virtual desktop so they could get access to all of their existing legacy applications from a remote and secure place as well. And then in that case, even 800 um, Surface laptops went with that so they can have the remote capability they needed for their employees. And then the third area was uh, schooling. As I mentioned, obviously, a lot of my children and a lot of uh, kids went to online schooling. And one example, we worked with the University of Bologna, a 900-year-old nine, university in northern Italy. And they you know, asked for our help at end of February because Italy obviously got hit pretty early in the pandemic. And within the first week, the university went with live with 50% of their classes. And by the end of the second week, they were 100% live with their online classes, all using Teams for nearly 9,000 students and almost 4,000 different courses moved online. So just some examples of how quick people moved and to your point the technology adoption had to support that yeah and, and really I mean the cloud architecture was was key in order to be able to move that quickly that absolutely fair to say so something that was interesting when we talked with uh, Elizabeth again I'm interested in getting your perspective on is we ran into some very unique challenges in different geographies and you mentioned some different verticals uh, for instance in India uh, you know getting people to work from home just the power infrastructure was 
different than, say, in the United States, as you can imagine. So you kind of touched on a couple of geographic things, but are there, are there any broad themes that you saw geographically that were different? Or again, you kind of hit on some certain verticals of education and healthcare. Is there any other geographic type differences, say, between India, China versus the U.S. and Europe? I mean, to your point, the the global and the local infrastructure is certainly different by country. And then there's even culture differences by region as well. So certainly we saw um, kind of different rates of adoption, different change management needed to drive the kind of adoption. But honestly, I'd say there was more similar than different in terms of, you know, everyone needing to have access to remote work, be able to collaborate remotely, um, you know, creating a lot of them like creating real time analytic systems so they can get real time information, some like uh, security, something that it was in different types of security needed endpoint networking based on where they were but those themes were consistent even if the execution was a little bit different i mean one one thing that we experienced uh different by geography is you know we obviously have data center regions all over the globe and over over 60 and so in each of those areas we had very had very quickly had to make sure that our employees were listed as essential workers so that they could get access to the data centers and make sure that they were able to um do that you know we don't have a lot of people at the data centers but make sure they could get there and in some cases just based on the local policy and requirement people had to actually had to live and they moved in to some of our data centers to be able to make sure they could be there when they needed to be so so, you know, there's certainly a lot of local differences in how we could execute too. Yeah, and it's interesting, uh, you know, the work we had to do also to be listed as an essential business so that we could provide infrastructure to these data centers that were providing that capability. It really is uh, interesting, the supply chain, when you look at the full, full, full supply chain. Yeah, uh, things you don't expect, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, a lot of things you didn't. We went through a lot of things we didn't expect through this pandemic, I'd say. But are there any other, you kind of touched on a couple. Are there any product features or other programs that you maybe accelerated as you, as you were working on this uh, pandemic? You kind of touched on a couple there, but were there any others that uh, come to mind? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. A lot of technology we've had in place, it just got rapid adoption, right? But um, so things like remote work or virtual desktop or real-time analytics, security, those are those are like the big themes we heard about. Remote development, um, obviously, we have a lot of developer tools and DevOps. And so those things, gosh, I can't think of a customer that didn't, need some aspect of those things. But um, with the, the you know massive shift, think about Teams adoption and the growth in that, um, we had we definitely fast-tracked some capabilities that we had been working on, but we needed to move much faster on. So if I think about just the innovation we've done in Microsoft Teams over the past few months, like dozens and dozens of new capabilities, whether it be you know like the new together, together mode where it shows you sitting in a classroom, which is like my favorite feature ever, um, but even like the large gallery, breakout rooms, multi-window meetings, um, calling support for under, over 300 participants, like a bunch of new technology just because, uh, or new innovations, just because the demand and the requirement was there. So we fast-tracked a bunch of that. And even things like uh, Windows Virtual Desktop, our VDI solution, yep. we fast-tracked our new admin UI around that, new, new security enhancements to help on the networking side things well. So um, I'd say a lot of things there, but we did go back and really rethink um, how we're putting our innovation and how quickly it's prioritized. And actually in one case, um, you know, we have this low code app development tool called Power Apps. So letting you build um, workflows and, you know, lightweight mobile apps really quickly. We actually took some of that engineering team offline and had them actually build applications for healthcare providers. So almost you're like, this is just super important. We need to help these hospitals, particularly in the early weeks, build applications specific to that. So we actually used our engineering team to provide the healthcare providers with pre-built apps and that I know any provider could then use. So different ways we did it. Yeah. Interesting. It really forced us to rethink kind of what was uh, what was uh, what was a priority. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Obviously, when people move to the cloud, there's there's a GDPR in, in security and privacy regulations that you see. I mean, what what you know? I mean, how are you addressing that? Or did that just go by the wayside because we were in the middle of a uh, a crisis and 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 is going to come back? Uh, just curious about your your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, mean, I think that uh, security and, and privacy and compliance didn't go to the wayside. I think what moved quickly and did, you know, kind of change was the culture change and the organizational behaviors around tech adoption. Uh, tech adoption. But I'd say the security requirements continue to be the same. And you know, and as you probably know, you know, hackers never waste a good uh, crisis, right? And so we saw the security threats really start to increase and change as COVID was happening. It's just new attack vector, a new surface area. Think about people who were suddenly needed to be having remote networking access uh, that didn't have the infrastructure in place for that. So 
I mean, from a security perspective, gosh, we've been investing for a very long time. We spend a billion dollars a year in cybersecurity around our, our you know, cloud technology. We have 3,500 dedicated cybersecurity experts. So I would say we were ready um, because this has been a very, very long standing investment for us. Um, so as people you know, started st standing up their remote work, starting standing up new you know, data systems, those type of things, we certainly had a lot of security engagements and I saw a lot of adoption of our security network in the cloud. Again, you could just turn it on versus need to install it and understand it and have security experts on hand. So things like network security, firewall, um, kind of Azure Security Center, looking at your whole infrastructure, rapid, rapid adoption of those technology areas. So because people weren't going to compromise security, uh, they just had to do it quickly. And thankfully, a lot of it was there in that way. Yeah, so I guess uh, the investment Microsoft's been making over the last number of years really paid off because you were ready for the security questions. Yeah, I mean, again, we have, yeah. our client base has long been highly regulated, you know, from governments to, you know, fin FinServe to healthcare. So I, mean, I, I was thankful we had this in place, but it was just getting people to uh, be able to deploy it quickly. Yeah. So, you know, I guess, so with this explosion of digital demand, so to speak, or whatever, you know, hyperbole you want to use, uh, you know, it was interesting when we talked again with our CIO, Elizabeth, and I've talked to some others said the same thing is she made a comment that because uh, I asked her, you know, is this changing your attitude on the cloud? Is it accelerating? And she said, uh, look, if people weren't moving to the cloud, they are now because they're going to have to. Um, so I'm curious, you know, do you see that with other customers that this is going to accelerate applications going to the cloud or is it not going to have a long term impact? Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I very much agree with you, CIO. Of the the cloud's been around, what the and the adoption's been, you know, growing steadily. But this just expedited it. And honestly, you know, have been been doing commercial cloud for over a decade now, um, from the Microsoft side of it. And I would say, then you know, people always ask like, what's stopping cloud adoption from going faster? What's the number one issue? And I'm like, the number one issue is human beings and culture <laughs> and our willingness to adopt and adopt technology and change. And you think about what people suddenly move to: Teams, virtual desktop cloud applications, that's not new technology. There's just been a lot of culture and, and for good reason, right? But culture change resistance and whether that be humans don't love change, we don't, we, you know, it's, called, it's allowed our survival, so it's okay. Um, but there's also been, you know, not always the best reasons for not changing. And so what I've seen COVID blow, just absolutely blow through a lot of the, the, cultural, the cultural resistance that wasn't founded in bus true business need or true kind of outcomes. And so that's, that's what's caused, I think, a lot of people to be like, you know what, I, we're going to go cloud and we're going to get over this culture change and just go through it. And I think even at Microsoft, we were in the headquarters, very office oriented. We were in the office, we were people lived in, in the Seattle area and we had a lot of culture around that and we believed a lot of things couldn't translate to remote work and guess what we've all learned that it can so we're in the learning sphere just like everyone else and our own technology adoption so I'm not you know not pointing at others or pointing to ourselves here as well but now that we've gone through that culture change I you know the customers I speak to and internally at Microsoft like remote works here to stay we're not all going to go back to living in the same city and doing the same commute and, you know, and going yeah. to the same office it just we don't need to. We've now seen, and we've worked through the the culture, the norms, the interpersonal aspects of remote work. Like we've done it, so we can keep doing it. Yeah. And then same thing with cloud adoption on the IT culture, uh, feeling like, oh gosh, I need to be able to touch it and control it to feel good about it. You're like, actually, it works a lot better when you have it in the cloud, where that's your center of excellence. So uh, I think those both of those things are going to continue to endure because the culture has changed. Microsoft's done a lot of work in yourself on hybrid cloud, right? Where maybe there's stacks that are running on premise that's separate from being in the cloud. Do you think that, yeah. you know, is that, were you doing that mainly because of the culture or now that we've blown through the cultural change, is there not going to be a need for an on-premise stack or is there going to be technological or privacy reasons that, uh, that might be there? Yeah, you know, it, uh, we think about hybrid or really it's just, you know, hybrid cloud or distributed application models. Uh, there's been really, there's two modes of it. The first mode is, hey, I have systems on premises and I want them to stay on premises. In some cases, I would say if I had to pick, you'd, I'd say 80% of the time it's culture, 20% of the time it's truly needed for compliance and regulatory reasons, and in some cases even network reasons. Um, so I think that those will endure and there are, there are absolutely reasons from, a, you know, policy, security, compliance, um, that people need to comply to local law, that uh, some technology needs to stay on premises and you work in hybrid mode with the cloud. The other, you know, the, the kind of mode two or the modern version of hybrid is basically distributed computing as 
in, uh, essentially, you know, you're thinking about all these endpoints, IoT devices, everything's connected. And you need some aspect of your application code running on that local system uh, for it to be able to understand the physical world that it sits in and get different information, whether it be understanding, you know, like right now, a lot of work, a lot of systems working on looking at a, a retail um, environment and understanding are people social distancing? Are they wearing masks? Are they doing things that we need to for health reasons? Um, so those type of applications that also need to be run in a distributed way, some code sitting on that edge device, some code sitting in the cloud. So that that will be enduring. And if you look at almost any modern application being built, it is a distributed, it has an edge component to it. And so that will remain. Um, but that's kind of a different reason. It's more of the architecture of it versus a security compliance or um, existing you know, uh, experience way based reason. Interesting. Yeah. So there's some compliance and then you're, you're talking about the distributed nature of computing, which seems to be emerging, if not here. And uh, that kind of raises an interesting question. If you get into this uh, more distributed environment and to get that model working, one of the things that we've been talking about is that that actually is making life much more complex from an infrastructure standpoint, from a CIO view, because now, um, you know, you used to have to worry about every wiring closet. You know, we've made the argument that people need to start treating that kind of like a data center infrastructure because you need that level of performance. You need to manage it and understand it and so forth. But so what we didn't expect, and we've been talking about that for a few years, but what we didn't expect is the, the nature, and you talk about working from home now is going to be a permanent part of how companies operate, is now when someone's working from home, and I asked Elizabeth about this too, is she now has to take some responsibility because what if the problem is their, their network at home isn't acceptable, right? And, and true story, I've seen this happen where we were working on teams, we were having a, a meeting, and somebody's network was bad, and they said, geez, this Teams thing isn't working well. Right, because because it manifests itself on a, as a team's application uh, challenge. I mean, just is that something you guys are starting to try and anticipate, or what? I, you know, because this is uh, something we're trying to fully comprehend. Is what does it mean working from home from a CIO perspective, and and when you're highly dependent on the network being available? Right. Yeah. I mean, it, interestingly, you, you talked about Skype on premise when we started. Uh, we've been learning this lesson since then, right? And I've been in, working in the UC cloud space for over a decade. And so um, dealing with last mile dependency is very hard. It is very complicated. And you, and you mentioned different countries, different regions. So uh, the variation is extreme. And so as we you know, learned a lot from our Skype and our before that link, if you remember that product um, journey that we've been on, and obviously we built teams um, from on a new platform. And Essentially, the team's design is we. It has to work uh, regardless of the last mile situation. And what we've done within Teams is an example of essentially we have it um, designed in a way that I call it. It, it degrades gracefully. Uh, so as the you know the last mile issues they come up, absolutely they're going to come up. with the real world. But things like you know you'll notice probably when you're using Teams, like the video might stop, but the vo the audio continues to be great. And so we'll choose. We've made that decision on that. Or you know, if the, the network starts to degrade before you even know it, we've what we've done is sl slow down how often we check your availability. You know, your your status of green, yellow, um, and so that's just taking down ba bandwidth in a way that you wouldn't even know. It doesn't really harm the user experience. And so we've been very thoughtful of how do we degrade, knowing last mile has high variance, um, in a way that has the minimal impact on the user. Right? Um, if there's a hard outage, there's not much you can do. But and also when there's a hard outage, you, people know it's not Teams. There's other things that are down too. So it's more obvious, but that's our, you know, we can't just say, oh, it's a last mile issue. Like that doesn't work. That's just an excuse. You have to create an application that can deal with a high, high variation of last mile and we'll continue getting better at it. But, um, you know, we saw, you saw us make a bunch of changes right around when COVID hit and there was a premium on network and people hadn't caught up with what they needed in their home offices. And so we had done it. We did a bunch of work to roll out like, you know, graceful degradation enabling that. We've seen that get better now that people have kind of had a chance to catch up and we're seeing last mile get worked on, um, but a continual journey there. Yeah, so it's an interesting thing because it's, it's a combination of how do we get the infrastructure as reliable as possible, meaning kind of power and cooling, that's the stuff we like, you know, but uh, and also, also the network infrastructure as well as the application all working together to make sure that the, you're getting the performance that you can, yeah. Yeah, and I'd say, the, I mean, one of the other areas we've been working a lot with customers is taking advantage of our cloud networking capabilities. Um, and so, you know, obviously, we have this massive global network uh, that's obviously high performance. We get people onto our network really quickly. We keep them on as long as possible. Uh, it's kind of called a cold potato approach. But so it allows for high, you know, much higher performance and guarantees. And so we have seen a lot of customers that hadn't been network customers of us before, you know, taking advantage of our network infrastructure. 
it's interesting. So, so uh, you know, I think those were most of my questions. I also I ask you one last one: is uh, is there anything we expect from Microsoft that you want to share with us, or uh, where where you might be in innovating or expanding your product suite? So. Um, well, gosh, lots of places, but I might say two things that we didn't hit on just to bring them in. Um, uh, our, we have obviously, you know, long history and in investment around mixed reality and in a place where we have remote work, obviously mixed reality can play such an important uh, role. Uh, you know, we've, we've now done, uh, surgeries using our HoloLens such that they can, doctors, surgeons can remote in other information, other experts as they're in the middle of the surgery. Um, and that's, you know, necessity for surgery, but think about when people are remote, you, know, you want this, whether I'm fixing a pipe or a fuel well or a, you know, a heart. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of potential and we're definitely pushing hard around how we can enable better and more robust mixed reality experiences. Again, using HoloLens, our Azure app services, our um, Dynamics 365 applications, kind of a range of things there. And then the other one is, um, a, bought a bunch of new demand around real-time analytics, right? So many customers have been running on good enough analytic systems, making business decisions with uh, maybe a month old or a week old, or, you know, information. That's not not cutting it anymore. You know, the market, the the customer sentiment's changing day to day, and so a lot of push around how do we um, even go more. And obviously, we have fantastic analytics capabilities with Power BI, Azure Analytics, machine learning, but um, more to do and more to come in that area. Interesting. Yeah, so it's interesting that, uh, you know, uh, the, what technology is enabled, and then you're just giving a number of examples of where the technology can enable things that we haven't really comprehended. And that, uh, uh, and I can tell you for us, so well, first of all, we, we, we owe Microsoft a thanks because uh, I don't think Schneider could have gotten through the, the pandemic without being able to work from home, and we couldn't have worked from home without some of the tools and things that you've provided. So thank you for that, and thank you for being a great partner, and thank you for spending some time with us today. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate it. Absolutely. Wonderful to talk with you. And I'm so glad that we were able to help you and many others. It's obviously an important time that we do our part. That's great. All right. Thanks very much, Julie. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Kevin.